Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to NGS. I am Jason, and I am joined today by Consort. And one of these days, Consort, I'm going to remember to put your correct name on the whole thing, the whole consummate Consort. But welcome. Thanks for joining me, man. How are you doing tonight? Hey, I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, don't don't sweat the uh, the full name. I haven't been using the stream for a while, anyways, and it's a lot. It's a it's a lot to type, a lot of screen space taken up. I need a shorter Twitch name. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, you know, you can change it now. It's kind of well, anyway. But uh, we are gonna go ahead and get into the game. We got Frank's Furters, and we have uh, Squad Nine Alpha ready to go here in the C division, and we are gonna get rolling on into the first map tonight which is Sky Temple, and I knew I forgot something. It was indeed those maps, so let, I will go ahead and fix that up for you guys here real quick. But uh, for now, Consort, what do you like on this map, Sky Temple? Well, I mean, Sky Temple is uh, one of the major maps for macro play, so I, whenever I get, personally, whenever I get one of those maps, I like to go into the Dahaka. Um, he's good in a good amount of matchups. He doesn't lose any matchups too horribly. And having that global pressure is, is always big. Yeah, global's definitely a priority here. A big rotation-heavy map with, um, you know, like you said, macro in mind. One of the things that I like to focus on here personally is the camp control, um, especially when it's used to uh, siege a different lane away from these uh, temple areas. So it can be a really good split-push tool, which can be dealt with by the globals. But uh, right away, first ban... Coming out here for Frank's Furters, we're going to see Stukov banned out. So uh, right away, focusing on that that strong healer. Stukov's been very prominent in the meta. Um, I like that ban out to start for Frank's Furters. Yeah, Stukov is causing a lot of people problems nowadays. Just, you know, anytime you have a crucial ability to come out, a good interrupt or a good, you know, engage tool, that silence can just oh, put an end to it immediately. You have a ban for Kael'thas and then an immediate snap pick onto Lucio. A very strong healer. Not surprised to see him in the top slot. Looks like we got a uh, birthday shout out request here in the chat. But yeah, Kael'thas, a very interesting ban. The start here for Squad 9 Alpha tells me that they probably knew something about Frank's Furters and what their tendencies are. Um, probably wanting to ban somebody out right out the gate. Lucio coming out here. So Frank's Furters, uh, you know, again, seeming to want to control that support game. They ban out the Stukov. They get the Lucio for the sustained heals and the strong rotations. And uh, we'll have to see now how... Squad 9 Alpha wants to take advantage of that. They've left a lot of good tanks on the table, a lot of high damage. So they're going to go to Arthas and Vala. Um, they're going to choose to not worry too much about the supports, because I think at this point, you know, it's it's kind of too late to make up for that deficit with how you've drafted so far. So just take the, str take the strong picks in other areas. Definitely. And Arthas is a good pick both to deny the Arthas-Lucio combo always a terror to have to deal with with Arthas having the movement speed to get on you and then the slows to never leave and also you know Arthas's primary weakness is usually is engaged doesn't have a way to get on top of things but when you're controlling the shrine and staying at one point he can be oppressive to try to come in on if they get to the shrines early and have Arthas set up it'll be difficult for the enemy team to try to attack and get that shrine back right and just in general it's it's a very good denial pick Arthas Lucio is a scary scary combination and you don't want to have to you don't want to have to deal with that um so etc will be picked up on the other side though a very strong hero does have the option to go with the global for later in the game if you want to go with that stage dive though lately mosh pit has just been a terror um in most team comps and they're going to also pick up to haka so they already have that global presence so they don't necessarily need to go with the stage dive but uh to haka a good all-around pick here like you had mentioned, uh, just a high priority. And uh, they're going to pick that before this next ban out phase starts. Yeah, and you know the stage dive, even though they don't need it with a Dahaka, it does open some interesting options if they want to go into it. It allows them a lot of mobility across the map to respond to which how many players that Squad 9 wants to send to what altars and when. Um, if they, you know, priority, if they get strong control on, on top shrine and then bottom shrine opens up, mid shrine opens up, everyone on the, everyone from Alpha 9 goes there, ETC can stage dive to Haka, can burrow in and turn that back into an even fight. I like this ban out of Greymane from Squad 9 Alpha. You could make the argument 
that gray main was already kind of countered by the arthas and how they've drafted so far but the vala um, is very susceptible to the burst and dive from the gray main so they're going to go ahead and just take that off the board they don't have to worry about it now and uh, now a band coming out here from frank's furters we'll have to see if they decide to continue to try and lock out those supports they could still ban the malfurion they could uh, ban out the brightwing for the global but instead they're just going to go for the sonya who's another strong frontliner to pair with the arthas yeah sonya also a good matchup um, into the Dahaka for the solo lane, so might be uh, solo lane protection as well. Does leave, if they're worried about that, it does leave Malthiel open, which is arguably a bigger problem for Dahaka in the solo lane. But Malthiel has some other issues going into this comp, and also picking Malthiel when you don't know how much range damage the opposing team is going to be using could be tricky. But it still could be a pickup given the two tank lineup. Yeah, I think it could be a strong pick here. Uh, especially paired with the Arthas. One of Malthale's only real problems is uh, the idea of trying to stick on somebody. Um, he does have the teleport ability to be able to help him do that somewhat, but, you know, against heroes like Lucio, where they can speed them up and try and get them away from Malthale, it can be it can cause problems. So I wouldn't be surprised if they wait on that solo laner here and pick their others, but they're just going to go right ahead with the Lucios, or be with the Leoric, so... Not not even thinking about Malthale, it would appear. And the Alexstrasza, very interesting. We don't see a whole lot of Alexstrasza, but I do like her on this map. Her big, beefy cooldowns with the Dragon Queen and uh, the Cleansing Flame, very good for fighting on these temples. Yeah, I, I'm not traditionally the, the biggest Alex fan myself, but I can definitely see the appeal going into this comp. They will be able to protect choice placements for putting down Abundance uh, Preservation. So they can get into that healing AoE. Um, in response, though, Chromie snap picked. And speaking of that preservation, that's uh, always uh, an interesting dynamic seeing the Chromie into the Alexstrasza because that big healing circle comes down and it's great for the team that needs the heals, but it's also a big old bullseye for Chromie's W. Yeah, and it's it's uh, it's a bullseye for any hero that's got good AoE um, abilities. And, and the Chromie definitely thrives in that situation. So I, I agree. It's, it's going to be... Interesting. It's going to depend on Alex Straza and how, um, you know, really how uh, responsible she is with the placements of those healing circles to be able to put them somewhere where the Chromie isn't likely to see them or uh, putting them down at a time when Chromie's not going to have uh, not going to have the AOE ability available. At least it's not the end of the world if they get hit by a Q, but if that W comes in, it could spell a lot of trouble. But the false dad. Also going to complete their comp. So very, very rotation-oriented, double global. And it looks like Frank's Furters here are looking to play the macro game on Squad 9 Alpha's map pick. Yeah, definitely specking towards the towards the double global here. And I'm actually going to make a prediction in here and say we're going to see something of a quasi-quadruple global here. I have a feeling that we're going to see Stage Dive ETC, and I think that we're going to see the talent on Chromie that allows her to port back to her previous Q cast position, because I've actually energy. seen recently Chromie's used that as a way to move across the map and then immediately swing back by just using W with the Mobius loop to lower the W cooldown to wave clear. And Kerrigan picked up as the last pick. That could be very threatening for some of the squishies that Frank's Furters is running. Little tricky to play around the East Tower Control from the ETC and Dahaka, but if she gets in and gets those combos, that could definitely be some kill confirms. Yeah, Kerrigan definitely going to be threatening to Chromie, Falstad, and Lucio. That is the goal for them to be able to get in and disrupt that back line. We'll have to see how the side of Frank's Furters are able to deter the Kerrigan and that dive. But uh, quick shout out, happy birthday to Wayne Carr. Uh, Smeagol Pigs thinking about you out there in the chat. And uh, we are going to go ahead and move on in to the match here on Sky Temple. Um, I really like the comp coming out here from Frank's Furters. I think that Sky Temple is a map that's all about that global rotation. So I think they've got a plan for this map. Uh, we'll have to see on execution, but just looking at the two strategies, I really like Frank, Frank's Furters in this one. Uh, 
Oh, uh, it looks like you're muted. Uh-oh. Oh boy, microphone is doing it again. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, I think uh, I think that uh, Frankfurter's composition definitely revolves around not taking a five-man fight on this map. Mm -hmm. Going into the team fight, they're just not as strong, but they have a lot of macro options. On the other hand, though, if Squad Nine Alpha can force a fight or catch some of the global heroes out when their global drop pull down, they can't escape. That's going to be their key to victory. Map. That's how they get ahead in this map. If you wish to. Know. All right, so we have now loaded into Sky Temple. First on your left, the blue team, Franks Furters with Indecisive playing the Chromie. Bog is going to be on Falstad. Um, Entropy is going to be on the Dahaka. VZ is going to be on Lucio. And Michael Ann going to be playing the ETC. And on the right side for Squad 9 Alpha, Four, we have Hot Wheels, three, Navala, Silversteel, two, and Leoric. Andrade on Arthas, Jungle Jim on Kerrigan, and Ara Luna on Alexstrasza. Alright, so we do have both teams rotating to the mid. Of course, with the global advantage from Frank's Furters, they will be able to quickly rotate up onto that vision and grab the site. But uh, both teams are going to start laying down the, uh, the front line uh, sprays at least, and they will focus on the wave clear. Dahaka actually going to the top first, so a bit of a rotation advantage already here for Frank's Furters. Yeah, already with the Globals in top and bottom lanes, trying to get Squad 9 Alpha to lose a little bit of soak, but they are rota rotating in time, so I don't think they'll be missing any experience here. Taking back over the Vision Tower. Earlier on, while they have the Globals, Squad 9 Alpha is going to be able to maintain a little bit of lane pressure because they just have stronger heroes for pulling out lanes. Indeed. Let's go ahead and get those talents up here. You guys can take a look at what these players are going for these this game. Keep track of that Chromey stack, which is up to five so far. Not bad for the first minute, as we do see Michael Ann sliding on out there. And uh, any talents that are catching you off guard here, Consort? Um, I, talents actually seem to be more or less usual. We see Falstaff moving into the Gathering Storm build, which is interesting. I was thinking they don't want a team fight, but taking the Gathering Storm talent suggests that perhaps they do at some point. I'm actually more interested by the laning assignments right now. You would think you would want Kerrigan on the bot lane with the Falstad and Leo on the Dahaka, but they have it mixed up. They have it uh, reversed, and I'm wondering, they must have some kind of plan for that. So I'm interested to see what that plan is. Yeah, just a kind of a standard one through one but I agree. I think an adjustment could be made here to make that... Uh that what they're what they're facing in each of those solo lanes they could adjust that to uh improve the quality of their solo lanes but hot wheels taking a ton of damage there from indecisive meanwhile michael ann uh kind of stuck a little bit in this uh in this frost is gonna try and get out with the face melt we'll have to burn that slide to be able to move out he is gonna go ahead and hit the b button go on back and get some health Yeah, and uh, it's, you know, story of the game is going to be whenever we have these matchups like this, three on three, and heroes have to fight, more than likely Squad 9 Alpha is going to come out on top. It's going to be when these altar phases, these temple phases come up, where we start to see Frank Furter's comp really shine and their global ability to move around the map, pick up camps, grab shrines, and so forth. Yeah, a little back and forth here in the bot. Boggs is going to be able to pressure silver steel back for the moment but we do have the temples activating here in three seconds mid and top automatically spawning in the first one bot will automatically be spawning in the second iteration of the map objective and right now it looks like uh both teams choosing to focus a little bit on the mid here to start yep and we still have the same three weeks matchup in mid, but Kerrigan's coming down to assist. The Haka is going to take the top temple instead. Still seeing both Bogs and Silversteel on the bot lane have not, bot lane have not moved their, from their positions yet. We'll see if they move up to secure a shrine sometime before this uh, phase ends. Meanwhile, we will see uh, both both uh, teams leaving one in the bot lane. Oh, and a slide in! As you mentioned, they're able to focus in on that healing circle to be able to uh, get the pick out onto the Vala. So, uh, early team fighting here in a 3v4. We actually see Frank Sverders coming out with the uh, first blood. Yeah, that was a, uh, an excellent pick setup and a huge boost for Frank Sverders, you know, composition because 
when you're going for the global composition and you're also winning these skirmishes, that's a huge boost, especially in this early game before things really start to kick off with the Burn Camp. Something else to fight over. Meanwhile, we will see the side of Frank's Furters trying to take full advantage of the damage they had done in that mid lane. They get in, get a little bit of extra damage while the side of Squad 9's rotating back down from capturing the end of the top shrine. And for now, both teams will go ahead and resume their laning phases as we do see Jungle Jim starting to head towards the top. But actually, they're going to start rotating now. Looks like, uh, yes, he will be going to the top. But, uh,. About a half-level lead right now, maybe a little bit more for the side of Frank's Furters, which you would kind of expect from this global comp. And But it's going to be a really big deal when this next map objective comes up, because they're likely to have 10 a uh, fair amount before our squad 9 here. Yeah, and having 10 early with the global composition opens it up to a lot of options to be able to secure temples if temple phases are up, push it forward, move around the map, maybe even try to force a boss before the enemy team can get ultimates and fight back. And we have a, an attempted invade onto Squad 9 Alpha's siege camps, but doesn't go quite well, and ETC ends up getting hit. Yeah, Michael Ann, I think, being a little bit too uh, stubborn there. He did get the slide in. He almost captured it um, on the steel there with the face melt, but... Uh, just, they were able to get back on the point in time, stayed a, a little, stayed a little bit too long, and the side of Squad 9 Alpha does a nice job of punishing him for it. And uh, just to point out, Chromie does now have her ulti on the board as she gets her talents a little early. And for a loop is the choice here, taking advantage of the fact that there's no cleanse or otherwise mitigating tools on the side of Squad 9 Alpha. If she catches somebody out like Alex Straza, Vala Kerrigan with that temporal loop, it could be a pick right there. Yeah, and it looks like that's kind of the strategy that they're going for. We have seen Chromie used pretty consistently as a counter for Vala. Um, you know, Vala, one of the tougher heroes to play in the game. Uh, one of the lowest health pools in the game overall, usually supported by that double support and uh, that carry, uh, the hyper carry combo with, with a shielder. But uh, only the single support. Three-man slide here into the mosh pit here. Four-man mosh pit. They are going to follow it up with the gust and the rewind, and uh, but so far no kills. They are slowly whittling down the health bars. They even pop the sound barrier. Finally, Arthas ends up being the first to fall, but they turn around. They're going to take down Lucio and Falstad, and now it is Frank's Furters that is on the run. The global comp not having the team fighting tools that are needed, and it is coming back to bite them right now. Yeah, and you can definitely see, like, that's going to be where their weakness is, is the team fight. And they need to macro a little harder if they want to win this. They landed a really nasty mosh there, but just not having the damage follow-up to take out enough members of, the, of Squad 9 Alpha to prevent them from turning on that fight and turning it into a favorable team fight, securing the temple, and getting a good chunk of damage on Zabot 4 here. And, you know, I mean, I think in, uh, in, in a game where I'm sitting there without my level 10s, I would not call that engage if I was squad alpha, but very nice understanding of the situation here. Meanwhile, Jungle Jim actually getting very low, dives in after the Chromie, is gonna be is gonna have to pay for it. The timeout paired nicely with the gust, however, cleansing flame gonna be able to finish the job as uh Ara Luna gets in and will get that final kill onto Chromie. So a one for one here in the bot, but uh, as I was saying, they I wouldn't have taken that fight, but nice understanding that they had the team fight advantage even without those ultimates. They go in and they get a they get good dividends in the bot lane. Yeah, definitely an excellent call and one that uh, a less experienced shot caller might not have seen beforehand. And I gotta say, man, nothing is more stressful when you're sitting about four or five health. You know the enemy team is an Alexstrasza, and you start seeing those fireballs rain down, and you know you've got about five more seconds to live before it takes you off the board. Yeah, well, definitely got to be the hardest um, ability in the game to try and juke as the Cleansing Flame, just so mobile, so able to get where it needs to go. And it's really one of the only things that makes, uh, that I feel like makes Alexstrasza really strong. Of course, the Dragon Queen is nice, but she's got a lot of downsides. Um, but that Cleansing Flame is definitely not one of them. Oh yeah, Cleansing Flame, very strong ultimate. Gives her an escape, gives her AoE healing, gives her some damage potential. This is an attempted pick on Falstad down here, but they've brought 
the entire team down to make this pick. The ETC has come to block and give the Mosh Pit to try to peel. They've got a good amount of damage coming out. Yeah, they are able to secure the pick onto the Vala, which was their main target of choice. Now not a whole lot of damage left over on the side of Squad 9, but uh, except the Kerrigan comes in. We're going to pop that ult and get a ton of damage out. Cleansing Flame also going to come down, so uh, I take it back. The damage was there in return even without the Vala. It's going to end up being a two-for-one exchange, and they're going to be able to clean up the bot lane and, uh, and allow the push there of that Siege. They're actually going to turn around and get a boss here as well. Yeah, they did lose, uh, they did only go two for one in the team fight, but they did allow the Haka to continue pushing up forward with a full night camp, so it ended up being a fort trade. But definitely going to get more than just the fort once this boss gets up. That's going to be pushing right into a keep and something that Frank's Furs is going to have to address immediately before they can start thinking about something. Yeah, on the side of uh, Squad 9 Alpha, getting a little bit low here. But we do see Silver Steel scouting out in the bush, protecting his team nicely. Actually going to go ahead and burn the March of the Black King there. Go ahead and uh, try to ward them away. Meanwhile, we will see uh, both teams just kind of trading out the temples for now. Dahaka spending uh, most of the last couple of minutes here capturing that top, that top area. Now we will see the side... Of squad nine grabbing the bot here yeah and uh one thing frank's Furters has been doing very well has been keeping the pressure and the attention away from that top lane giving the haka a lot of time to push in I have to wonder though if it would be better to have the false dad up there if we're dragging attention away from that lane false dad's wave clear a little bit faster has a little bit better of an escape option but either way they managed to get that top four the haka in a little bit of trouble here will he make it to the gate not quite just Got caught with that Kerrigan combo a little bit before safety. Yeah, tried to burn the isolation there to survive. Could not ultimately get out. And uh, the rotation from Frank's Furter is just a little bit too slow. But now, after all of this, you start to look at the uh, at the structure damage. Pretty equal. About a, a third level lead at the most here for Squad 9. It's actually pretty even coming out here as we start to head towards the late game. Yeah, Squad 9 has a 4 kill advantage here, but structures are even and experience is close to even as well. Mostly because Squad 9 has been rotating in large chunks, missing Soak in a lot of lanes, while Dahaka has been, again, largely up touch in this top lane, just soaking away, pushing lanes. Uh, but one thing to really look at too is Squad 9 Alpha has been very good about getting Merc Camps on the board. This is something that Frank's Furters really should be focusing on a little more, having the macro-oriented comp, but Squad 9 Alpha is doing a great job of denying these camps, denying that resource from the global just by being there and having a superior team fight. Definitely going to be a hurdle Frank's Furters is going to need to get over if they want to get any further in this game. And Frank's Furters on the run here. Level 16 has been picked up for Squad 9 Alpha, and they are charging in. They're going to go ahead and burn the march. It will be slided out there, and Silver Steel going to be the first to fall. Cleansing Flame coming down to try and continue the chase, but with Lucio, they should be able to disengage. Michael Ann turns, though, is going to burn the uh, Mosh Pit. They will trade him out for the Kerrigan. And now the uh, Rewind gonna going to stall Andre trying to get out here. But now level 16 is picked up for Frank's Furters, and both teams are going to uh, go ahead and walk away here. Overall, though, a one-for-two exchange. Nice response from Frank's Furters there from the dive. Absolutely, and, and Michael Ann in particular played that really well. He had a lot of resources devoted onto him when he was stuck out there. Kerrigan combos getting dropped on him. He was the primary target for damage. That's exactly what you want to be in a tank in a team fight. You want to be taking resources onto you and keeping them off of your team so they're free to do damage and heal. And even just getting that mosh pit to keep them from diving past and you know setting up another kill there. Just excellent play all around. Yeah, and we did eventually see that Mosh interrupted not only by ETC's death, but also a well-timed reign of vengeance coming in from Hot Wheels. But uh, ultimately, that that really is, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the only Mosh counter. I guess the Kerrigan stun could be used for that as well. Uh, but that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah, unless uh, Alex Straza has Dragon Queen up. If Dragon Queen is active, the Gust, I believe, could be used to cancel the Mosh as well. We were getting a little low here, but March of the Black King got to oh. back up, and now Falstaff is in trouble. 
Yeah, nice answer to Boggs there, but meanwhile, Indecisive in all kinds of trouble ends up coming out of that time out there and just into the fire. Jungle Jim able to capitalize on that. The Cleansing Flame coming in to try and help them chase, but ultimately the side of Frank's Furters will get out with just a Chromie falling, but nice invade and capitalization here in the bottom to steal the camp by Squad 9 Alpha. And I have to say, like, I'm amazed that this is a remarkably even game for the, you know, variance in the compositions. You know, yeah. one being very team fight focused, one being very macro focused, but neither getting a clear advantage yet. Structure damage about even, experience about even. Kills a little higher on Squad 9 Alpha's part of the board, but Frankfurters is making up with that with macro, with just better soap. So, really, uh, really close game so far. Yeah, this is definitely not what I was expecting out of this game. You gotta give a lot of credit to Squad 9 Alpha for just playing the macro so well, because with Frank's Furter's comp, you would expect them to be a little bit more, you know, mobile around this big map and all the globals that they have, being able to control the wave clear and the camps, as you've alluded to. But uh, so far, it's been Squad 9 Alpha really controlling the board. This might be the tipping point here, though. Boss is back on the board. With the significantly better team fight comp, it's possible that Squad 9 Alpha might look to force a fight here. Even if Frankfurters wants to stop the boss, they just might not have the tools to do it. Yeah, and they have both teams playing around the boss, keeping an eye out for it, maybe looking to see if they can find anybody caught out. Aura Luna comes out a little bit. Michael Ann will dive in but with that uh, with that slide, but not catching out Aura Luna. Nice, uh, nice peel there by Silver Steel, getting up and making sure he's the one to take that slide and be able to zone away a little bit. And right now, both teams kind of playing for twenty. Uh, Frank's Furters has the the Dahaka up in top, soaking, trying to get them a little bit closer. And both teams inching their way there a little bit at a time. Yeah, it looks like Squad Nine Alpha is going to prioritize taking the temple. This leaves the boss undefended for now, but of course, if Frank's Furter's members start going off the board, they're going to know that they're probably doing the boss. So, a little dangerous to be going after that right now. The Hawker Rotator on the board taking camps while the rest of Frank's Furter's tries to contest his temple. Yeah, we will see the side of Frank's Furter's actually trying to force here. They do catch Aura Luna and get a huge pick here. The Mosh Pit to follow it up here as they are going to be able to uh, isolate out Jungle Jim, or is Jungle Jim isolating out the back line? Hard to tell here. Silver Steel going after Indecisive. Going to get a lot of damage out on him, and Boggs will burn the march, but it's ETC that is the next to fall, and it is uh, Squad 9 Alpha turning without their healer, able to take ETC off the board and proc the retreat here from Frank's Furters. And Frank's Furter's doing a great job of pulling the team fight, even with the the less viable team fight comp. It's actually really interesting to see how well each of these teams is playing the part of the game that their that their draft is not designed to do in this game. Frank's Furter's putting in some excellent team fight, even with a global comp, and Squad Nine Alpha playing the macro really with the team fight. But now Squad Nine Alpha is trying to force balls. They're also invading the siege camp. Chromie and Stasis might be in a little bit of trouble here. Yeah, once again finding indecisive but the timeout this time is long enough to allow the side of frank's furters to respond they get the pick on leoric they're going to get the pick on arthas as well the rewind is uh actually not going to find its mark there um, but we will see frank's furters getting a two for nothing and now going to be able to work on uh getting getting their their lanes pushed out here and they are going to go ahead and go after the boss leoric is here to be able to see it but uh we'll have to see two down here for Squad 9 Alpha, not realistically a lot that they can do about this. Yeah, I don't see a way for Squad 9 Alpha to try to stop this boss camp take, and that's really painful when you're going into a global composition. Once boss is on the board, they can send a few members with it, push down the lanes, or they can send, the, you know, have their globals elsewhere, taking camps, pushing other lanes while they have to devote to deal with the boss. Either way, I think we're going to see a significant chunk of keep damage here, maybe even a keep taken for Frank's Furter. Yeah, we will see also the invasion of the siege camp here. So they're going to have a pair of these stone throwers behind the boss pushing into the lane. And with an already damaged keep here in the bot lane, almost assuredly this is going to be a keep for the side of Squad 9 Alpha. In fact, I would put that straight to a guarantee. The boss will do it on its own. But uh, the question is, can Squad 9 
come back here and at least keep the game rolling from this boss push. Bottom keep does fall. Frank Furter is going to retreat and just in time for Temples to come up. We're probably going to see Frank Furter prioritize that middle shrine to begin with because of their map control problem. Yeah, we will see a uh, um, kind of a lucky outcome there for Squad Nine uh, with those with those catapults pushing. They decide to play it passively. You know, they are ahead right now, um, at least in the in the in the uh, siege department. A little bit, but uh, ultimately they don't have the team fighting capability to be able to hold this shrine, hold uh, both of these shrines. So they're going to go ahead and split yeah, Tahaka to the top. But meanwhile, the side of Squad Nine looking up to get the chase and a three-man combo from Jungle Jim will proc the sound barrier. VZ able to get in there and save them from the cleansing flame. But uh, all the while, Tahaka being able to get a ton of damage onto this top keep. Yeah, Dahaka just able to get pretty much the entirety of this top temple unopposed. Knight's pushing in on top keep at the moment, but Transfer is probably not too worried about it as the keep was going to die there anyway, and the will take care of the rest. Yeah, and we will see the Dahaka falling here, not rotating out quite quickly enough. Squad 9 Alpha with a nice rotation. We'll be able to seal the last few shots here. But now one keep on each side, and as we keep going in this match, more and more consort, I'm seeing that this game continues to be very, very close. Yeah, this is turning into a real nail biter. I mean, like structures are nearly identical in health. Experience is almost completely even. Uh, Squad Nine Alpha looking to take this night camp invade, keeping up with their tradition in this game of just invading merc camps, keeping those resources off the board for Frank's Furters. Definitely a good call. Having these merc camp pressure with the auto push lanes going is going to force Frank's Furters members back to keep clearing core over and over again, mitigating their global pressure a little bit. Would you say that as this goes on longer and longer, there's a slight advantage to Frank's Furters globals? Or would you say that um, the side of Squad 9 Alpha with this uh, high damage high team fighting comp has more of an advantage in lane here. You know, it's hard to say, but I think a major factor we need to look at going into this late game is the pickup of Apex Predator and Epic Mount. Uh, that's going to let the Globals bounce around a lot more if they utilize that. Ooh, which has, as I'm saying, this Kerrigan getting caught in Temporal Loop, taking a lot of damage. He gets out barely alive. The Cleansing yeah. Flame able to keep her alive, but the chase is good indecisive missing a little bit on that rewind but is going to make up for it with the turn and all of a sudden squad nine getting caught out a little bit too far being a little bit too aggressive and now frank's furters are looking to come in and make them pay here and this is looking to be the point where this match finally swings squad nine looking look to use their team fights team fight to try to leverage and just get you know raw seeds on the bottom keep but it worked against them they got caught out they're losing members they might lose the vala here not quite my fairly gets out Arth is trying to make a turn but i just don't think it's gonna happen yeah and i don't know i feel like this could be a core call here for the side of frank's furters that is going to be the direction that they start to head with only the vala and the arthas to defend actually we do have leoric coming up as well but it looks like that's they, they uh, are thinking about it still. They do not have the Dahaka just yet, but should be able to come in with that Apex Predator. We will see Michael Ann taking a ton of damage instead of going for the core, opting to go after the, the keep here. Yep, and just keeping pressure up is really all they need to do at the moment. Dahaka is free to take a top temple. And as long as he has it, that final keep in mid is going to go down. They're zoning for him now, blocking him out, but Squad 9 Alpha just is going to, I think it's going to make this call and just go all in on this. Yeah, they have to. They cannot allow this temple to continue to, uh, to, to slowly chip away at the core health. They're also now out of keeps, so they're at a disadvantage in this, and they are going to go in, but the Gust going to come in from Boggs on the back line, taking a little bit of damage. Michael Ann also taking a lot of damage. Cleansing Flame coming out as well. But we are going to see the Vala being traded out here early. 
And uh, it is going to also be the Falstad going down. Things starting to go Squad 9 Alpha's way here. The Sound Barrier comes out, but Indecisive going to fall anyway. VZ also getting very low, trying to speed himself out. Michael Ann, the only one left. He is going to end up eventually... Uh, actually, I think he's going to make it out, but the GG's have been called here with Squad 9 Alpha having enough damage to come in and finish this off. Um, and the base is not going to go down fast enough on the other side. Um, but they are going to have to get in here and do this quick with uh, with those, those catapults. But ultimately, it should be Squad 9's game here. And I have to say... That last team fight, it was hard to see, but it was decided by maybe the clutchest Kerrigan stun I've ever seen. That Gus came out, clumped up the members of Squad 9 Alpha, ETC came in with that power slide and was looking at a monster mosh. But just before the power slide had started, Kerrigan predicted where it was going to end and already had the stun set up. Prevented the mosh pit from coming off and just let the team fight pivot into Squad 9 Alpha's hands from there. And from there, they were able to make a few picks and then steamroll into core. What an insane back and forth game by both these teams. Squad 9 Alpha making the call that they had to make, making the plays at the end of the game at that top temple. And they come out with a win on their map choice here in game number one. Man, that was just a crazy, crazy close game. Uh, there were so many, so many points through that where I thought that the momentum was going to swing one way or the other. And then... It just never did all the way up to what level 22 is where we finally started to see a, a decisive you know victory on one side or the other yeah just just uh a, a crazy long game um you know a, like, like you said a crazy back and forth game and that top fight was insane we could go we could spend forever uh going through that one and figuring out every single person's role and and how that was won and lost but uh ultimately the bottom line squad nine gets the win and now we are going to be heading on over to our second map which will be infernal shrines map pick of Franksfurters, and uh first pick first band will be going over to squad nine yeah and i'm already excited to see this map play out if it's anything like the first one was we're going to be in for a great show yeah Cannot deny that one, that's for sure. So I'm going to get this lobby set up for you guys. Should be just a moment, and uh, we're going to have game number two ready for y'all. What are you looking for um, in these two teams adjustment-wise? Any any big adjustments that either team really needs to make here? Well, I think Frank's Furters is going to need to make a pretty big adjustment here from last game. Not, not so much because they didn't do well with the comp they had, but just because running so many globals isn't going to work quite as well on a smaller-ish map like Infernal Shrines than it did as it did on a map like Sky Temple, where it's very macro-focused. Now, Infernal Shrines is still pretty macro-focused. You do have a lot of options because the Punisher isn't the strongest objective in the world. You can decide to do other things instead of trying to contest the objective. But they're probably going to need to spec a little more into the team fight, build some better, build a little more of a team fight focus going into this match than they did in the Sky Temple. Yeah, I, I think that you're right. I think Global does have some advantages on this map, but it's it's not nearly the same value that you can get on it um, out of out of Sky Temple. I think that uh, here it's you know it's more wave clear based um it's more about being able to control the point and we saw squad nine alpha's comp in that first game be a lot more conducive to that strategy so um i think yeah more of an adjustment from frank's furters here than than squad nine and uh, we'll have to see what these teams have in store for this kind of uh map style yeah and that said though um Going into that Sky Temple map, Frank's Furters played a global comp and then team fought with it very well. Yeah. If that's any indication of how well they team fight on average, with them going into a more team fight oriented comp, that could really put Squad 9 in trouble. If they're able to team fight that well with a global comp, they could be a real threat with a with a comp meant to team fight. <laughs> Thanks. 
Uh, I, you know, here I am just trying to be a nice guy, telling both these guys that they played a great game that first one, and I get indecisive with, thanks, Dad. <laughs> All right, well. Let's see if these two teams are ready for game number two. I tell you what, I've been I've been seeing that line a lot lately. Whenever I try to make a suggestion in draft Dad? in my Hero League games, on ranked draft games, try to make a suggestion, say we need a healer or something like that. There's always always uh, some smart aleck with your response. Thanks, Dad. And it's like don't don't remind me that I'm getting old. That's you know? that's true. Uh, when I'm playing video when I'm playing video games, I'm 18 again. Right? Yeah. That's how old I am. Don't don't remind me that don't remind me I'm getting old, man. That's not cool. It would hurt a lot worse if it was true, I guess, but, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, not, uh, I, I, I get you on the age point, though, that's for sure, but either way, we are heading in here to game number two, Infernal Shrines, and, uh, Frank Sferder's looking to bring this to a draw, get themselves a point coming out of tonight, and, uh, but a first pick, first band going over to squad nine, uh, what heroes do you really, really like? To see band out here on Infernal Shrines to start. Oh man, there's there's so many heroes that are great for their own reasons in this map. It's almost hard to choose a first band. First thing that comes to mind is Sonya, Monster Solo Laner gets a lot of value onto the shrines because of Whirlwind. But there's a lot of ways to go on this map. You can go for you can go for a composition that controls the shrine. I've seen compositions that are focused more on poking it out and being able to race the minions without necessarily being there. There's also picks like Sylvanas to worry about. It can be split pushing your forts when you're trying to take the objective. A lot of things to worry about. Kael'thas is the first ban with a response ban onto the Lucio. Both of them good bans. Kael'thas can be a threat here because of his AoE damage and range. Fast at picking up shrine minions. Can poke them out if he doesn't have control of the shrine. So probably a decent ban here. And Lucio, always a fantastic ban. He's just an incredible healer. Yeah, so electing not to deny the Stukov. They wanted... Ready. To, in the first game, I think they wanted to leave Lucio open for themselves. But uh, this game, deciding to ban it out without the power of that first pick. Um, and it is going to be the Stukov Greymane coming in here from Frank's Furter. So going with a couple of very, very strong um, just meta picks here. But let me ask you one question, Consort. We saw the Kerrigan in the last map. Do we see it again here from Squad 9 Alpha? Uh, that, and that's actually a very good question. I mean, Infernal Shrines is considered to be one of her better maps. She can go into that Ravage spec that allows her to clear Shrines insanely quickly, or she can go into her standard spec and just be a constant threat that she can always be jumping in from these weird vision angles on this map with that combo and take somebody out. So I would actually expect to see the Kerrigan here. They seem pretty confident running her on a map like Sky Temple. I don't see any reason why they wouldn't run her on this map. Yeah, I would say this is definitely her best map. One of the only, uh, one of the only heroes that can really rival Sonya in terms of shrine clear. But uh, Muradin is going to be the start, so they're going to go with that frontliner to start. And uh, Vala, of course, already their pickup from, uh, you know, same pick from the last game. So I think that's a pretty strong pickup here. But they are going to go with the Sonya, which suggests that we won't see Kerrigan. But I've actually seen it a few times so far in NGS, so it's not impossible. Yeah, it's still still a possibility, although a less likely one. Yeah. So uh, going to be interesting to see if they do want to go into it. Sonya, again, as I was saying during the ban phase, kind of a beast on this map. Can just pick up a lot of value onto the shrines, a lot of wave clear, great solo laner. Um, at the moment, with what Frank's Furters has on the board, they, she might be solo laning against the Grey Main, which is a decent matchup. But I expect that they're going to put a more traditional solo laner up there with a little more sustain as we get further into the draft. But first, we're looking at the bans. And definitely, uh, they're definitely thinking about what they want to ban here, not rushing into anything. Yeah, they are hovering the Kerrigan here, so they are th definitely thinking about denying that pick this time around from Squad 9 Alpha, and that is going to be their ban out. So uh, with the Stukov not being very mobile, it's hard to blame them for that ban out. I think that that's very, very smart. For the side of Frank's furters. Um, and and in a situation like that where the Kerrigan was such a terror in that first game, you know, I like that ban out. Just force them to play something else. Force Squad 9 Alpha to show you that they can beat you with something different this game. 
Oh yeah, and I mean, you know, Kerrigan not usually on my list of banned heroes as far as what I'm worried about in a draft, but man, I, I don't blame you when you when you get into a game and you see a Kerrigan, you know, go to work on you like that. I'd be banning her too. It's, it's definitely one of their comfort heroes, something they're pretty experienced uh, at running, comfortable running, so, you know, just take it off the board. Deny on the option. Yeah, I like the Diablo ban out here as well from Alpha. They've got the Muradin, so not going to look for another heavy frontline tank like Diablo. Uh, it's also a very good combo with the Stukov Silence and the Greymane, uh, as his ability to Dark Flight in and focus down a target with that Diablo charge. And he's just, in general, he's very good on Infernal Shrines, so very solid ban out here from Squad 9 Alpha. Yeah, Diablo is just... he. Yeah, I feel like he's one of the more underrated tanks. He doesn't see as much play nowadays. And he is kind of map specific, but he can be a real terror when on certain maps and in the right composition. And Frank's further is going into the Anubarak and the Gold Dam. Yeah, good old Anub with the web wrap here to try and counter out probably the Sonya, but um, you know, a couple of options there for the web wrap and Gold Dan, just incredible wave clear and good ability to clear the shrines as well um, counters a lot of the healers in the meta so it does kind of force um a couple of specific healing picks here for squad nine they at this point they don't want to go after the uther with that goldan on the other side so uh more likely to see um malfurion possibly the ariel um or uh could also see the Rhaegar here yeah, the Malfurion wouldn't be a, wouldn't be a terrible pick here. It's a good amount of sustain if he can get in with the Moonfires. Mirrodin can keep him relatively safe from the Anubarak Greymane. Interesting to see what healer they opt for here. They definitely have options. And of course, I forgot the Bright. How do you forget about Brightwing? It's a very interesting final pick with the Tracer. So uh, likely to see Brightwing going with the Phase Shift build here. Um, we'll have to see what the what the main um, what the main uh, solo laner here is going to be for Frank's Furters. They could stick the gray main there, but uh, they could also decide to pick up another you know heavy front line that has the ability to do that. The Sonya and the Kerrigan are off the board, so we could also see um, Arthas coming in here, or uh, possibly a Leoric or Malthail. Yeah, def uh, we'll have to see what they decide to go in here with this fifth pick. They definitely have some options. Tracer, an interesting call. Usually Tracer picked with some kind of enabling tool. Here she's not going to have that, so she's going to have to be a little more careful than usual. And I wouldn't be surprised if Franksfurter maybe even decides to pick up something like the Variant. Won't be online till level 10, but just a way to hard oh, shut down the Tracer and the Vala. But instead looking to go into the Leoric. Yeah, I agree with you that I think Variant Taunt um, could be really, really solid um, as a Tracer counter. One of the best counters is Brightwing, so uh, picking that up at the same time is uh, is a pretty solid pick. Of course, Frank's Furter's already had Stukov, so not really a big danger for the Brightwing counter, but uh, ultimately no counter to that Tracer. It's going to be a scary life for uh, Stukov and uh, Gul'dan, who really just don't have the mobility or sustained to be able to get away from him and uh, deal with the tracer yeah and while there's there's no there's no direct counter for the tracer there's no hard counter for the tracer here but one thing they do need to be very careful of is if Grayman decides to go for go for throw to 10 that's a significant portion of tracer's life bar right there on one button press and she takes a little bit of extra damage accidentally takes a few you know fell flames from goldan or a corruption from goldan a couple hits from leoric that could be an instant reset on go for the throat for Greymane, and then he'll be into the fight in wolf form, hitting things with his big meaty autos, and still have a second charge to go for the throat ready to try to take out a Vala or a Brightwing too. So she needs to be really careful because if she gets taken out specifically in that way, which I'm sure Frank's Furters is going to be Prepare looking for, it could be a real teams. momentum shift in favor of the, of the opposing team. For sure. Meanwhile, we are loaded in here. On to Infernal Shrines for game number two. Frank's Furters is going to be the blue team on the left. VZ going to be on the Stukov. Indecisive is going to be on the Anubarak. Enemy of Entropy is going to be on the Gul'dan. Boggs on the Greymane. And Michael Ann on the Leoric. 
And on the right for Squad Three, 9 Alpha, two, we have Aruluna one. on the bright wing. The Hot Wheels begin. on the Tracer. Silver Steel on the Sonya. Andre on the Muradin. And Jungle Jim on the Vala. So both teams heading on in to the mid. And uh, I do see a question in the chat here from Logic Hots. What's this tourney? So we are playing uh, NGS tonight. It's an amateur league um, that just started uh, last week. This is uh, week number two here uh, of this six-week season. There will be a playoffs, of course, after the regular season has concluded. And if you want more information, uh, they've got a really nice website, Nexus Gaming Series, and a uh, good Discord that will give you a lot of information. And really easy to get, uh, get involved in NGS. It's not too late to join as a sub for a team or start looking towards... Uh, season number four, which will be starting up in April. Uh, really fun league, and uh, I've actually been playing in it. Definitely worth checking out. And both teams looking to uh, start these rotations, picking up these mid and bot minions, get the XP flow going. Goldan just hovering more towards mid there to keep the waves from pushing up too far, with a three man of Greymane, Stukov, and an Uberak bullying out the bottom lane. Yeah, both teams prioritizing the bot lane, which is interesting. Um, kind of, you know, kind of in the area where you can always rotate to these three different bottom camps. So I kind of like the idea of, of uh, both teams keeping the majority of their team here. Though a lot of teams do elect to rotate. We will see Hot Wheels coming up here um, along with uh, along with Muradin. Trying to, uh, trying to work on... The Goldan trying to get the wave clear out, but we are going to now see Hot Wheels looking for the gank up in top, or at least a little relief here for Silver Steel. Yeah, Sonya into the York in the solo lane is a tough is a tough matchup for the Sonya at times. Probably going to need to see constant rotations like that to keep the solo lane active. Silver staying out with kind of a risky amount of health left to go, but still keeping this EXP so going. Yeah, and that's really the only job of the solo lane. You know, you don't want to risk the death um, and the extra, not only the XP going in from that death uh, into the enemy's XP pool, but also all the XP that you lose out not soaking the lane. So right now, Silver Steel doing his job, just making sure to get the lane soaked and uh, get that XP for uh, as they uh, go in towards the first shrine here. Yep, and First Shrine will be in top, so that advantage that Michaelon has been getting in top is going to pay off. But they might just get the and they do get the kill on him before the Shrine phase comes up. So now it's looking like Squad 9 Alpha may have dominance over the top lane, and it looks like we have a pause. Yeah, so it looks like we have lost Aura Luna for the moment here. Uh, who's, of course, team captain for the side of Squad 9 Alpha. So we'll just give her uh, a couple moments to get on back into the game and... Uh, we we'll definitely don't want that poor Brightwing bot hanging around. And it looks like already back. So let's get this started up once again. There we go. Huh. There Only we go. ref can unpause. But uh, we do have our Luna back here. And now we will be... Uh, Heading towards this top shrine, both teams. Uh, looks like they might actually be splitting out the Leo here for the side of Frank's Furter. So not full committing to this first shrine, but instead uh, looking to get a little bit of an XP advantage here. Yeah, and definitely a good call. Merc Camp was still active in bottom, just kind of chunking away at that tower. So they needed to address that, especially since this first Infernal is usually not great for much more than grabbing a gate anyways. Yeah, without something with very strong pushing power or something like uh, Sylvanas to be able to shut down the towers, these Punishers don't really get all that much work done. They're very predictable. It's easy to bait them over the wall and just easily kill them. And it looks like that's what Frank's Furters is prioritizing here. They want the XP advantage. They didn't. Uh, they maybe didn't feel like they had a favorable team fight um, in this first bit and are looking to get uh, a bit of an advantage somewhere else in the game. Yeah, and on top of that, always good to have Leo available on the mid and bottom lane when they're open because of the double soak potential, which is what he's been doing, getting them a significant chunk of XP. Punisher is pushing top four now, the wall is down, it's an arcane Punisher, which is the hardest to defend, 
but still the first Punisher, so not terribly threatening. Yeah, they do get the entire front wall here. A couple of uh, hold-your-breath moments there for Frank's Furters as they uh, struggling a little bit with that Arcane Punisher, but ultimately they do make it out here with actually pretty even XP, as uh, they, as even with the, the extra damage and XP from the uh, front cannon towers there, they're able to keep up from the extra side soak here. Yeah, and I mean, that's the uh, that's the advantage of having side soak, especially one that can soak two lanes at once while the objective is up. Keeps you in the game XP-wise if you're behind and can put you ahead by a bunch if you're, if you're even when you start. And Silver getting a little low here in the solo lane, which is shifted down to bot, but does manage to get out. Squad 9 putting some Merc camps on the board. And we're going to see a little bit of the neutral laning until the next shrine comes up. Yeah, both teams resuming the laning phase here. One to nothing in the kill count. So far, the only death was that uh, that Leoric death in the top lane right before the shrine. Could have also been part of the reason that the side of Frank's Furters were, uh, you know, deciding to back up and, and play a little bit more passively there. But ultimately, you know, both of these teams have recovered. We will see the next... Punisher phase spawning here in the mid for this uh, mid shrine and a just slight XP lead for Frank's Furters. But I wouldn't be surprised if both teams have level 10 right around the time that this next shrine is active. Yeah, and it looks like Squad 9 is going to get their Shaman Camp on the board. Try to get it pushing that lane out early. Maybe a little too early considering that the shrine phase timer hasn't started yet. We'll have to see if Frank's Furters tries to get theirs running while the shrine phase is active. And again, I'd like to point out, you know, another another very even game so far for these two teams. Frank's Furters is going to hit 10 about a half a level early, but not so early that they can really push that advantage in any significant way. Yeah, it would have to be incredibly well coordinated here for them to get it in this window. There is the window. Very small. Level 10s come in for the side of Frank's Furters, and there they are for Squad 9 Alpha. And the hero heroic picks are coming in hot. We're going to see Horrify along with uh, Web Wrap, the Cursed Bullet, Flailing Swipe, and Leo holding his for the moment. But we'll have to see if Michael Ann decides to select the Pulse Bomb coming out, though. We'll get that last second heal from VZ. going to be able to save him. But on the other side, it's going to be Emerald Wind, Rain of Vengeance, Avatar, and uh, it is going to be the Quantum Spike coming out from Tracer. Uh, no heroic pick yet for Sonya either. Yeah, interesting to see what uh, what they're holding the ultimates for. Leap could be valuable for Sonya here. Get onto the uh, Goldan and the Stukov in the back line. And there's and that the is Leap. actually what she picks up. And it is, once again, going to be March of the Black King from Leoric. We've seen a lot more of that lately than, um, than the Entomb, but I am kind of disappointed. Frank's Furter's missing a little bit of a combo in terms of being able to pair that Entomb with the Stukov lurking arm. Yeah, and perhaps missing an opportunity as well. All of the backline for Squad 9 Alpha went up to address that Merc Camp in top. They had a chance to move in and put some damage on tanks. Unlikely they would have gotten a kill out of it, but at least put a little pressure up going into the Shrine phase. But now it'll be a totally even fight going into this. Yeah, we do see Michael Ann rotating up here. Um, does have March available, of course. And here comes Frank's Furters as a big advantage so far on the Shrine. For Squad 9 Alpha, the web wrap comes out. Leap will come in. Emerald Wind splitting up the members of Frank's Furters a bit, but they are able to re engage, but not before they lose uh, one of their members right out the gate here. So they do end up uh, losing the Grey Main. Uh, but ultimately, we actually see the side of Squad 9 Alpha backing up. They realize they have a lead here. They're going to go tap and maybe look to re engage, but that does give Frank's Furters the chance to catch up here on the shrine. Yeah, and Squad 9 didn't lose a hero, whereas Frank's Furters did lose Greymane. It's going to take him a little time to get back, longer than it took for Squad 9 to hit the fountains and tap up. Gives him some time to try to finish the shrine, but man, 33 to 35 minions, it could go either way. Yeah, and back and forth they go here. Indecisive getting very low. He is going to fall 38 to 38, but Frank's Furters gets the last couple of minions, and they end up with the steal here. Squad 9 Alpha waiting just a little bit too long, and even though they get two kills during that Shrine phase, Frank's Furters, very impressively, gonna end up picking themselves this up, and Jungle Jim with a very risky call here. 
But he is going to go ahead and just casually pick up this camp here in the mid. Yeah, interesting call too to get the camp going. Not sure oh. how much value it'll get. And super risky with that health bar. But the Punisher is being dealt with. It doesn't look like it's going to take a fort here. And I gotta say, that, that last shrine phase, kind of a TLDR for this whole set. Just very even the entire time with momentum swings both ways. And you're never quite sure how it's gonna work out. And I may be wrong, this fort might actually go down. It's maybe one range minion basic away. Oh so no, and they're leaving it unattended! Oh, no. <laughs> that is a bummer. Huge shout out by the way, Baha. Thank you very much for the for the host. Uh, welcome everybody coming over. We have, uh, we, if you're just joining us, we've got game number two underway right now for Frank's Furters versus Squad 9 Alpha here in the C Division. Very, very even first game. And now we see also here a pretty darn even game number two so far. But right now, the invade from Squad 9 Alpha being rejected and pushed back here from Frank's Furters. Yeah, and they, the, uh, the invade also cost them some, some ultimates there. Brightwing had to pop Emerald Wind to secure that backup, so... Could be a little bit of momentum towards Frank Furters' side. We're seeing another engage and an excellent horrify. Huge horrify coming in from Enemy of Entropy, able to uh, isolate out our Luna. They're going to get the Brightwing pick, and now the side of Frank's Furter is going to rotate around the map, split up a little bit for the XP, answer to the Vala push in top while they go ahead and capture this. But uh, we do see the uh, Pulse Bomb coming out from Hot Wheels. Going to have to push Enemy of Entropy back for the moment. But uh, ultimately, they will still be able to capture this uh, this camp in the bot. They get the gray main camp uh, in the mid. And right now, Frank's Furter is owning the map for the moment. And there have been some very close calls with these Tracer Pulse Bombs. Uh, a little bit later into the match, they may start translating into straight up kills. So that can start to really weigh on the Frank Furter's chances of success. Yeah, we do see the side of Squad 9 Alpha starting to stack up here in the mid. They're gonna get the night. They're gonna get a nice clear there. Both camps will be pushing in top. Meanwhile, any second now, we are gonna hear the toll of that next shrine phase, which is going to be in the bot. Both teams still have very healthy structures down there. Both teams still have their their respective um, their respective uh, well, healing wells down there. But meanwhile, Michael Ann caught out a little bit here, but with that extended wraith walk. Able to walk out Hot Wheels, living life on the edge, diving in deep onto that fort, trying to get him, but both teams will walk away unscathed here. Yeah, and seeing the value in Ominous Wraith there, the first time that gank attempt was made, they did get Leoric, but this time with that extended Wraith Walk, he can just get so far away, and on top of that, he can Wraith Walk through heroes to reduce their damage. Gives him a lot of escape potential but also a lot of damage mitigation potential in the team fight. If he can get that damage reduction on a Tracer, on a Vala, that's, that's going to be a lot of damage reduced. You know, it's going to be a very uphill battle for Squad 9 Alpha once that happens. Well, Squad 9 Alpha picking up that camp, which we're pushing here, but we're going to see a huge Cursed Bullet coming out. Um, on to, ooh, and the Tracer also getting web-wrapped as well. We see so many heroics coming out here. The, the Emerald Wind going to try and split them up, but ultimately the Sonya going to be the first to fall as Araluna not able to push the side of Frank's Furters back long enough. Hot Wheels going to have to go back after taking a ton of damage, and uh, it's going to take a little while before the Brightwing Heels can come in to be able to let um, Squad 9 Alpha re-engage, but even then, they're down a hero now. Yeah, it's looking like the Shrines phase is going to go over to Frank's Furters. I don't think that Squad 9 Alpha can try to engage. Without that Sonya, they kind of need that second front line to keep the Vala and the Brightwing protected. But they're trying to move in, trying to poke a little bit. Not quite enough, though, if Frank's Furters does pull the uh, Punisher. Yeah, level 16 also in here for Frank's Furters, so they have the talent tier advantage. Um, Sonya is coming back, but right now the man advantage still there michael and very low but we'll eventually get that health back from uh from the stukov and uh again long rank walk trying to uh lessen the the damage here as they push in the silence coming in as well to try and help zone and actually the web wrap coming out onto the tracer so they're going to be looking to follow this up the punisher also going to be right in this area the jump in and the blow up is good onto the tracer oh man you have to love 
when the Punisher follows up on your CC. Just you get that you get that first sun off, and the Punisher's like, I got you. Let me finish this for you. John Cena MVP right now. Another jump in onto Silver Steel, and gonna go down to John Cena. And all of a sudden, Frank's Furters coming in. They're getting the the bottom uh, keep down. Question is, can they end here? They think they can. You know, and I, I think I agree with them too. The, you know, the secondary value of having this ominous wraith, real focus, Leoric, is not just the ability to reduce damage in the team fight, but also reduce damage coming in under the objective. That Punisher lived for a good long time, and part of that being just because damage dealers were having their output reduced by that royal focus build. But here comes the counter chase here by Squad Nine Alpha, but the turn is real as <laughs> they get a ton of damage out uh, onto both the Muradin and the Tracer. Ultimately, Aralina will be able to heal that back up. But uh, right now, both teams uh, kind of looking towards the next phase here. Level 20 for Frank's Furters, and uh, just in general, map presence here for Squad 9 Alpha. Yeah, and it's starting to look a little grim for Squad 9. They're behind significantly structure-wise. There is one keep down. Mercs are pushing that lane as we speak. Giving a lot of time for Frank's Furters to pick up Merc camps elsewhere on the map and try to get some pressure. Squad 9 Alpha going for their uh, Shaman camp again. Not timing it with the objective, just trying to get it out and get some pressure on the lanes. That lane is pushed up pretty far, so it's not a bad idea to give them some time to get some XP. Well, we do see Boggs up here grabbing this Bruiser camp. They're going to be able to meet that up in the top. The side of Squad 9 Alpha very busy having to clear these lanes out from all the different pressure. A lot of pressure heading into the bot that they're going to have to answer to, and they're going to send Silver Steel and Jungle Gym to go ahead and do that. Meanwhile, we will see the next Shrine phase has spawned in mid. So uh, good RNG for Frank's Furters. There's, not, there's barely any damage at all on the structures here, but no fort for the side of Squad 9 Alpha in that lane. Yeah, and speaking of forts, that recently picked up Shaman Camp is now pressuring top fort against Squad 9 Alpha. If they don't send someone up to deal with that soon, it could take the fort all on its own. Only about a third of the health remaining. Looks like Mirren is going to come up and deal with that now. They do need to prevent any oh. losses and structures. Jungle Jim caught out in no man's land here. Not going to be able to make it away. And ultimately, that's going to be a huge pickoff here. For Frank's Furters, as again, any second now, we're going to hear the toll of that next Shrine phase. And there it is, as we uh, level 20 right around the corner. And uh, Frank's Furters coming out smelling like a rose as they head towards the end game here. Yeah, Alter phase will be up in 15 seconds. Frank's Furters already maintaining control over the area, zoning it out. Even going in for the team fight here, 20 is going to hit the board at any moment. So they want to try to force this. Maybe even get some picks before the shrine even comes up. Yeah, but down the Vala, going to be hard for them to complete that, especially as Frank's Furter is playing this smart. They're rolling around as five. They're not going to allow uh, Squad 9 Alpha to catch anybody out. And now level 20 is here. The shrine is up. And uh, this is looking, uh, looking kind of rough here for Squad 9. Yeah, I, I still don't see, I, I really don't see a way they can contest on this shrine phase. 20 of the shrine minions are already on the board. Best bet probably to be what they're doing now, just get some XP, try to catch up that 20 advantage. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't look like they're going to get enough XP to make 20 for themselves before this Punisher gets onto the keep. That's a possible win condition. This could be working towards the end of the game. Yeah, I would even say uh, very highly likely. Um, win condition, but we'll have to see how Squad 9 Alpha plays this. You can bait the Punisher to one, to uh, the top keep here. It is an option, but uh, yeah, still a level and a half till 20, so uh, they got a lot of lot to deal with here. Yep, and Punisher is baited over the wall, but the wall in question doesn't last very long anyways. Both teams now over the keep fighting for it. Punisher wailing away on the keep, slowly going down as the team fight continues. Yeah, Silver Steel having to burn the leap to get out here. Hot Wheels taking a ton of damage from the Punisher. The keep is going to end up falling, but the Punisher down to 25% health. So at this point, Frank's Furters 
Uh, maybe a little bit risky to try and end, but they are going to go ahead and go in with the 20s. They get the Tracer and a huge fear to pick off another couple of members. An enemy of Entropy with another huge Horrify to be able to secure themselves a couple picks. And this should be the end here. Yeah, all game Squad 9 has done a good job of not clumping to avoid some of the area of effect based ultimates Frankfurter has had. But finally, Frank Furter was able to get them to clump because they were taking forward. They didn't have anywhere else to go. And that's when we saw a massive Mark of Black King come out, massive Horrify. And that bought them enough time to take the four down. And that is going to be it. The core falls here. And Frank's Furters are going to make it out of this Thursday night match with a win. And we will end up with a draw here in this match. One team, one point going over to each team into the standings for season number uh, three here for NGS. And uh, overall, just a couple of really good games. That first game, very even, but Squad 9 Alpha eventually able to clinch it in the end on their own map choice. And here, Frank's Furters picks Infernal Shrines, and uh, you could definitely see why. Good macro play, uh, good pickoffs and rotations, and just a very high amount of pressure throughout the game. Yeah, and I'd like to point out, too, the Michael on the Leoric, nearly 20,000 experience contributed that game. Uh, having him in the off lanes double soaking during some of the shrine phases really paid off. Yeah, so we will go ahead and reach out here to Michael Ann, and we'll see if we can uh, get him on in for an interview. Maybe him and uh, one of his other members here. Meanwhile, you gotta give, uh, you gotta still give a lot of uh, respect over to Squad Nine Alpha. They they played very well in the first game, and they they uh, they did what they could to stay in on the second game. You know, they they didn't uh, they didn't make any glaring errors throughout the throughout the uh, mid game. They were able to keep themselves uh, at a point where they they could have come back if they had had um, just a little bit better execution in some of the team fights. Um, but but still, you know, Frank's further is playing the macro well not giving them that that opportunity that uh, maybe they would have wanted to try to get. Yeah, I mean, both matches across the board very close for, for the majority of them. Even the Infernal Shrines map, really close, even going up into, you know, level 12, level 13. And that level 12 to level 13 Punisher was only won by two minions, man. Um, you know, in a, in a parallel universe somewhere where a, a single one was changed to a zero somewhere down the line. Uh, that could have been a Punisher for Squad 9 Alpha, and we could have been seeing this, the win for Squad 9 Alpha snowballing off that Punisher instead. So, all in all, very close games on both sides. All right, so we are going to go ahead and hop up to Lobby 1 here. We are joined by Boggs from the side of Frank's Furters. Congratulations, man. How are you guys feeling right now? Uh, we're feeling uh, pretty disappointed that we lost the first game, but Aha. Uh, pretty, pretty good that we... At least got the second one. Yeah, so both teams winning on each uh, on each of their map choices here. Very close first game. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, your guys' overall strategy with all the globals and and how do you guys feel that uh, you executed there on Sky Temple? Uh, first game we like we chose the globals obviously like because of the the temples and the boss like they're very important for the map so. Uh, we didn't like use the globals as well as we, we had hoped, and Tahaka uh, like never rotated as much as we would like to, but uh, that's why we chose them. So. All right, so going into game number two, felt like you guys had a really, really solid uh, lockdown onto uh, Infernal Shrines. So uh, you guys, great rotations. Uh, who's your guys' shot caller, and how do you guys feel like overall? How are you guys feeling about the second game? Uh, indecisive. Uh, he used to be our support. Uh, he's our shot caller. Um, with like, the help of Michael in. Um, sorry, what was the second part of the question? Um, how do you guys feel like you executed on Infernal Shrines? How do you guys feel about that map? Uh, we were, we felt like that's our strongest map, so we've been, we've been playing a lot and we felt we executed it pretty well. But, I don't know. Team fights were a little iffy. All right, Consort, I will pass it on to you. Any questions? 
Yeah, I actually wanted to ask. Um, I noticed that from game one to game two, you had a little bit of a role swap with Michael Ann moving from the main tank role to the more bruisery Leoric and Indecisive taking over his role on the main tank role with an upper rack. Was that more of an issue of what heroes each player was comfortable with, or was that a decision based on performance from the first game, or were there other factors involved? Uh, we decided it before the match, because we, uh, we, like, uh, BZ doesn't usually play supports, so we re we moved him to support, and then Anubarak, uh, uh, Indecisive, and Michaelin both uh, decided that first game he would play a uh, tank, and second game uh, Michaelin would switch off, so... It was really just to see who could do the role better. Ah, I see, I see. Yeah, and it's, uh, I actually, I must not have been paying enough attention because I didn't catch the role swap on the support as well. But, um, yeah, I mean, definitely a, a very well done game, uh, both games, but very impressive with the, with the role swaps going into game two. Uh, yeah. <laughs> not good at interviews. Yeah. And uh, I'll go ahead and pass it back over to Jason. All right. Well, thank you very much. Congratulations to Boggs. Um, and uh, you know, I I totally understand the the split. Um, not being not being super uh, enthusiastic about it, but you know, congratulations for at least getting out the uh, the one point and putting on a good show. Overall, both games were uh, were very entertaining to watch, man. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the cast, guys. Thanks. All right, so we have uh, also, since it was a draw, I, I feel uh, only fair to also reach out to the captain here for Squad 9 Alpha. And uh, so we are going to go ahead and bring in their team captain, Ara Luna. Go ahead and grab out the invite and um, have her head on in to the Discord. Uh, worth noting, ladies and gentlemen, we're also going to be doing some replay casts after this has concluded, so don't go too far. Uh, we're gonna start right right at the top of uh, the oldest replays and work our way down, but we are now joined by Ara Luna, and uh, congratulations on that game number two win and a good series overall. How are you guys feeling tonight? Pretty good, pretty good. I'm pretty proud of the team that we got our first win for the season, so I'm happy about that. Well, there you go. So um, on, the, on the first game, you guys pick an overall very heavy team fight oriented comp. What was your guys' strategy there um, on on Sky Temple? So um, what we like to do is we really like to take comp like on Sky Temple. We thought area denial, so instantly they ban Stukov, right? So we ban Kalthos, mm -hmm. but we you know our whole goal there is just push them out, push them off of the temples, and it seemed to be it seemed to work in the end. <laughs> And push camps really on that map. It's about keeping the pressure on. So that was the whole strategy there. It was just camp, 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 push, 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 and it seemed to work in our favor. Yeah, and also one thing I did want to ask you guys about is double Kalthos ban. Um, I, I assume that is is scouting, but uh, were there any other reasons in particular you were looking to deny the the Kalthos? Um, on Infernal Shrines, I think the main reason that we wanted to deny Kalthas was because of the Phoenix. Because that Phoenix, if you put it on a shrine, it can be devastating. All right, so and I'll pass it on over to Consort. Um, do you have any questions here for uh, for Luna? Yeah, actually, um, what I, I do want to ask, like. What was what was team morale looking like with how long that that first match went for with how close it was? I have to imagine it got it got pretty uh, pretty anxiety inducing as the game kept going and it still continued to be so close. And I was I was uh, you know I was pretty anxious myself just watching it. I didn't know which way it was going to go. So how were you guys feeling as that was playing out? Oh man, um, it's funny you say that because we were like at that point all kind of screaming at each other, all kind of like just scared, like, be careful, back up, back up, back up. And it was just like, it was incredibly tense. Um, but ultimately we tried to keep a cool head and made the right decision in the end. So I'm happy about that <laughs> for sure. 
Yeah, and I gotta say, it was a it was a great game to watch the whole way through, and uh, I especially want to give I mean I want to give props to all you guys, but especially to uh, I believe it was Jungle Jim playing your Kerrigan, um, played a played a really a really good Kerrigan into that matchup. All of you guys played fantastically, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, possibly casting a few more games from you guys. It was an excellent set. Awesome! Thanks so much. Any shout outs you want to make before we? Uh... Head on off into the end of the night. Um, hi, mom. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case she might be watching. Hi, Facebook. Um, there yeah. you go. And great job, Squad Nine. I'm proud of you guys. And great, great game, Frank's Furters. All right. Well, congratulations once again, and uh, thank you very much for uh, putting on a good show for us tonight. Uh, well done. No problem. Thank you, guys. All right, well, that is going to do it for us here for this matchup, guys. Next up, we're going to have our first of what I hope are multiple replay casts. So uh, stick around. We're going to go ahead and uh, go to a little break while I get that all set up. But uh, the replays tend to go through a little bit quicker. So, uh, you know, we won't we won't have to uh, set up with all the teams and, and all of that good stuff. So it should be, should be fairly quick. And uh, we'll be back with that in just a bit.